Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see so many of you here for this session, which we're calling Equality from Policy to the Front Line. Um, I think we've got three aims today to inform you uh, a bit about what we're trying to do on the equality agenda, to exchange views, so I hope we'll have plenty of time for you to give me some of your views about some of the issues that you're facing, and then I hope to energise you a bit, um, so you go away feeling energetic and passionate and raring to go. Um, so, a few words about me. I'm Jonathan Rees. I'm the, uh, the head of a new government department called the Government Equalities Office. I've been a career civil servant all my life, which is now a very long time, um, some 32 years. I've worked in a whole range of different government departments, so from the, uh, the DTI to the Cabinet Office to Number 10 to the Foreign Office to uh, the Health and Safety Executive, and now I'm at GEO. Um, and essentially, though, I am one of those people who deal with policy. Um, and therefore, what we want to do today is also to get some of the experiences of people who don't live in uh, Whitehall, but actually are doing real jobs. So let's start off by seeing how many of you uh, would describe yourselves as policy people, policy deliverers. Who would describe them? I, I, I would tell you, policy deliverers, frontline deliverers, and equality in HR are going to be my three specialisms, just to help you. Um, and there might be another category. So who thinks they're a policy, policy deliverer? Okay, most of you, I would say. I'm not as good as David Dim will be on this. Um, who thinks that they're a frontline deliverer? Right, we're going to keep coming to you for views as to what you think, but obviously the policy element's going to be a bit stronger. Who's involved in equality or HR? Okay, well, that's a, a big segment. And, and who thinks they're in the other category? <laughs> ah, right. Okay, well, we'll talk afterwards about what you do, in a sense. Um, so the agenda for this afternoon, and we've got about an hour, is firstly, we're going to play Who Wants to Be an Equalities Millionaire? And if the uh, technology works, but um, the bad news is that there isn't a million pounds in prize money. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about the Equality Guide, um, uh, in terms of what we're doing in the GEO about the equality agenda. Then we're going to have a bit of a discussion. Um, and then uh, if we have time, we'll play a video. But as some of you will have heard, uh, we're probably going to be interrupted before the end by a very important visitor who will then say a few things. But let's start with um, the equality from Policy to the Frontline, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Now, those of you who've got these on your seats... Um, we'll see that they've got numbers, so uh, we're going to give you four questions, or we're going to give you ten questions to which there are four uh, potential answers, and you have to press them. So let's have the first question, please. So, I'm not going to read out the questions. I don't know whether... Um, Chris Tarrant reads out the questions. He probably does, doesn't he? But um, I think you can probably all read. Can everybody read? Yeah, okay. So the question is, now you press, and that little green light will tell us how many people have voted. So everybody vote, and once you've voted, your green light should come on and go off. So has everybody voted? Okay. Now let's see what you voted. So, that's interesting. Tower Hamlets and Leicester is the clear favourite. Well, I do know that that's not the right answer. The right answer is... You and me. So, that's the first question. Um, let's try question two. <laughs> Religious diversity in equality terms is of increasing importance. So, uh, again, uh, which of those areas are all fairly southeastish or Londonish? Yeah, no, they are Redbridge, Harrow. Redbridge is A, Harrow B, Slough C, and Ealing D. So, vote now.
Okay, and let's just see. Are we all voted? Good. Let's then move on. And you're all wrong again. <laughs> um, the answer is indeed Harrow. By the way, I didn't get these right, so don't worry about it. Um, now we come to question three. Ah, no, I did get this one right. Um, but then it is my job. So, uh, what proportion of the House of Commons are women? 19.5, 32.1, 20.5, or 12.8? What proportion of the House of Commons are women? Vote now. And let's just see what you voted. Ah, it's very good. You've got it wrong again. Um, <laughs> the answer is A. It's roughly a fifth. Um, and that actually is a very big increase from a few years ago. So we now come to question four. And this is a bit closer to home. We roughly say that ethnic minority people comprise between 10 and 11% of the population. So what percentage of the senior civil service is made up of minority ethnic people? Which of those figures? The optimists among you will doubtless put A, which is 10.4, 5.2, 3.6, or less than 1%. So let's see how you voted. Oh, I'm devastated. You got the answer right. The answer is indeed 3.6%, um, which shows that we have a way to go. I mean, it is on an upward curve, which is the good news, but we have a way to go. Now, question five is all around disability and how many disabled people live in the UK. Um, and disability generally is self-defined, so people who consider themselves to be disabled. Um, and so it's 7 million, 5 million, 1 million, or 10 million. So how many disabled people do you think there are in the UK? Okay, let's see how you voted. And, oh, you're getting the hang of this now. <laughs> you, I mean, the right answer is indeed D. So a third of you got the answer right, which is excellent. Um, we now come to a question about volunteering. And which English region has the highest level of volunteering? So, is it the Southwest? Is it London? The Northeast, Yorkshire, and Humber. Which English region do you think has the most people who volunteer? Your chance to vote now by pressing the buttons. And let's see what you voted. Um, you've certainly got the swing of it now because the correct answer is indeed the Southwest. But still, uh, we're not quite getting overwhelming majorities for the right answer yet. But I'm sure we're going to get better as we come to question seven, um, which is another question about uh, disabled people. And it is, what is the employment rate gap between disabled and non-disabled people? In other words, uh, how much less likely to work are disabled people than the general population. Is the gap 10.8%, 15.2%, 30.7%, or 26.3%? So, have you all voted? No? I. Let's see what the answers you voted for are. Quite interesting. I, I, they must have rounded it down somehow, mustn't they? But anyway, the right answer is not 15%. Okay, a slight glitch with the questions there. The right answer is 26%. So those of you who voted for 26% uh, got it right. That was the one that we put in wrong just to throw you out. <laughs> um, I mean, Chris Tarrant doesn't have this problem, does he? 
Um, but anyway, I did ring a friend after we did these, and the friend in ODI said the answer is 26.3%, so that's okay. Um, so we now come to the number of people over 65, of which there aren't too many in the room. So, <laughs> so by what percentage is the number of people over 65 expected to rise by over the next 10 years? 8, 34, 12, or 23%. We all know that we are all getting older and the population as a whole is getting older, but how quickly? Okay, have you all voted? And let's see what you think. Well, that is really amazingly good. That's your best answer by far, because the correct answer is indeed uh, not that. <laughs> and the correct answer is 51. I uh, know oh it's not. It's 23%. I think that I think these slides are getting a bit confusing to me, at least. So, what's the next question? So the overall gender pay gap, i.e. by how much more do men get paid than women on average? Now, um, uh, if there's anybody here from ONS, we can, oh yes, Rolanda's here. Um, we can have a long debate about how you measure this, but we're just measuring it on the basis of the average pay that men get per hour, the average pay that women get per hour, and putting it all together. So is it 18.3? 28.4, 22.6, or 12.7%. So if you voted, and what's your voting? So majority of you are around the 22.6, which is the correct answer. We seem to be back to an hour. Final question is what year? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I keep missing the drum beat. <laughs> See, Chris Tarrant doesn't have that. I, was, uh, I mean, so what year was the Equal Pay Act introduced? Which of those four years? 1981, 97, 1970, 1968. Okay, if everybody's voted. And this is a brilliant audience because the correct answer is 1970. So that's the end, I think, of the fun and games. Um, but there are some things that I think those statistics show us. I mean, I think the first thing that everybody in the room knew and understood is that the population is aging. Um, and already the numbers of over 60s are considerably more for the first time ever than the other eight under 18s. What we're also seeing, and many of you will be personally experiencing this, is a growth in the number of people uh, in the over 80 age range. And indeed, one of the issues that we are tackling um, is the so-called sandwich generation, where people might be looking after children and also looking after uh, older parents or older relatives in some way. I think the second thing that clearly comes across is that the number of disabled people is growing um, and many of those disabled people aren't yet fully integrated into the economic uh, life of the country. Third issue is that the population is diversifying in all sorts of, of different ways. Uh, fourth, on gender, on women, we do have the highest employment rate in, um, uh, in Europe of women. And what is interesting is that if you look at the statistics on the ground floor exhibition about the civil service, you'll find that the majority of civil servants now are women. But we still don't actually have sufficient women in senior positions. Civil service is much better than a lot of outside organizations. The figure, if you look at FTSE 100 companies, boardrooms, the number of women who are in executive positions is less than 5%. So there are some issues there. But also the gender pay gap is, above all, a pay gap against people who work part-time, both men and women. 
So 80% of part-timers happen to be women, but in practice what you are seeing is if you work part-time, you get less pro rata, and actually you don't get such good quality work. Um, and the final point that I thought we could draw from that was the importance of place. So we saw different statistics around volunteering. We saw different statistics around economic activity. Um, so it's actually quite important when you're looking at this. And one of my favorite statistics is that this image of the white man uh, between 21 and 50 working full time is now just under 20% of the working population. In other words, we have a much, much more diverse working population, and obviously we have a much more diverse area of people that we work with. So I'm just going to run through now um, pretty quickly some of the stuff that we're doing around equality before we get on, I hope, to um, a chance for you to give some of your views. So um, if we look at the second slide, we'll see that it comes up, which is excellent. So we're now on to policy to practice. So let me start with who the Government Equalities Office is. And the Government Equalities Office will perhaps come up. I don't know whether I'm supposed to press these harder, but it's clearly taking a bit of time. There we are. It's working eventually. I mean, essentially, we're a very small policy department, um, which uh, um, has a disproportionately large number of ministers. Um, uh, so we have four ministers, um, and our job is to look at equality policy, equality strategy, equality legislation uh, across government. Um, I'll say a bit more about all of the things that we do, but essentially um, we need to work with people in other government departments, we need to work with people in other parts of the public sector and the private sector if we're to deliver on that ambitious objective, which is improving equality, reducing discrimination and disadvantage. And one of the main ways that we're doing that at the moment is through legislation. Um, and the legislation, I talked a bit just now about some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, and in, if we look at the challenges that we're going to be facing, we've talked a bit about the gender pay gap. Um, I think there's also a challenge around employment gap. We've talked about the disabled gap, um, but uh, we, I think, also need to uh, be looking at the BME uh, gap, um, which is, there we are, we've got the challenges at last, um, uh, in terms of uh, a BME gap of 13%. What's interesting is that that gap um, was roughly that level in 1988. So um, uh, it then got worse in the last recession, and then gradually it improved over the next 20 years. So far, this recession, it looks quite good in one sense, that there doesn't seem to be a disproportionate impact on BME people, but it's one of the things that we're going to, to look at. Um, life chances. I mean, increasingly, I think, over the next 12 months, we will see the debate begin to focus on the differential life chances that people have. Uh, essentially, therefore, um, poor, bright children get overtaken by um, less intelligent children from a middle class or a rich background by the age of five. Uh, and as a statistic, that shows the importance of education short start at the very start. It also shows the importance of looking at some of the, um, uh, the issues between both um, social class, social housing, where people live, where they're brought up, and the more traditional equality strands. And increasingly the debate, as we'll perhaps have a discussion about, is looking not just at the traditional equality strands, but also people's socioeconomic background. And then, as we say, there is some evidence of age discrimination, there is some evidence of homophobic bullying. Now, if we move on to the next slide, um, what we have are um, a series of proposals going before uh, through government uh, and through parliament now, and they have just finished um, today the Commons Committee. 
Um, I'm not going to say a lot about the Equality Bill package, um, other than to say that it does a number of different things. It firstly consolidates all the legislation that we have had over many years that has grown topsy-like, some of it European, some of it domestic. So we have a major piece of consolidation. So by next year, we will have all of the legislation in one place. But secondly, what we will have, and I think we need to say a bit more about it in a second, is a new duty on all public sector providers, the new single equality duty, uh, we'll have a new socio-economic duty on some of the strategic providers. And we're also tackling um, the end-to-age discrimination in goods, facilities, and services. Some really interesting stuff for those of you who haven't looked round the ground floor of the exhibition stand, Department of Health, um, showing how they're beginning to tackle the ageing population. But actually, when uh, the Department of Health themselves did a um, report last year, what it showed is that there's a differentiation in treatment between older people, people aged over 60, and um, those under 60 of about £6.5 billion. Pounds. Now, £6.5 billion pounds used to be a lot of money um, until uh, the, the recent um, banking crisis. It's still an awful lot of money in terms of older people do not get the same level of treatment right through from GPs to social care to hospitals. And that's one of the things that the legislation will make illegal, but clearly we need to think through the practical consequences of that as we go forward. Um, so that's, I think, all that I wanted to say about the actual legislation. I then did want to talk about what we are calling fairer and more responsive public services, um, because I think it will affect everybody in this room. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, what we have at the moment is a lot of people, particularly those from HR, and equality backgrounds know is that we have the three existing duties. The race duty that was introduced following the McPherson report nearly 10 years ago now, which asked public bodies for the first time to consider the interests of people from ethnic minority backgrounds and to think what they could do positively about that. We then had, more recently in 2007, um, the disability duty and then the gender duty both coming into force. So what we have proposed, and um, it's got broad cross-party support, uh, other than on the, the element of religion and belief, is that they, the new duty should be um, uh, embrace all of what we call the different equality strands. So that's things like age, sexual orientation, religion and belief, and gender reassignment. So the three existing duties will all be merged into one new single duty. I'll say a bit more about those principles uh, in a second. Um, what the duty does, for those of you who haven't come across it, is it has both the negative bit, which is all around eliminating discrimination, but it's also unique in terms of um, uh, West European uh, legislation in that it uh, has a positive duty on public bodies to think about the services that they are providing. Sometimes people find it quite difficult. So a couple of e simple examples. Um, uh, in Merseyside, for instance, there were um, quite a lot of fires that were happening in um, particular communities. And when they went to look at it, they found that they were all happening in the Bangladeshi community. Um, and one of the reasons was that actually uh, the, the local authority said, well, why aren't people doing anything about it? I mean, we can we all fit smoke alarms for free. So what's happening that people aren't picking them up? And what they found was that they were sending round hunking great male police fire uh, and fire officers to these, uh, these communities, and they weren't being let in. So the simple thing they did is, right, look at our community, lots of Bangladeshi women, they'll probably deal more easily with women, send around women, lots of fire alarms put in, uh, and the result of that was a reduction in the workload. So that's a sort of very practical example of some of the things that the public sector duty has done. Um, on the other hand, I think one of the challenges for everybody in this room is that the public sector duty has also become a little bureaucratic, a little tick boxy. 
Um, I think lots of organisations have found that they have drawn up equality schemes, which are, for those of you who have ever read them, let alone ever had to put one together, incredibly long, detailed, um, and essentially not driving the business. So one of the things that we are consulting on at the moment is to try and say to people, actually, we don't want you to produce separate equality schemes. We want you to make sure that equality is mainstreamed in your business. Now, how many people here have any knowledge of equality impact assessments? Quite a good number. Um, and again, I think one of the challenges for equality impact assessments isn't that they're the wrong idea, but that they're actually not always done in the right way at the right time. Certainly in a policy context, we very often find that equality impact assessments are done a bit late in the process. After the policy has been decided, somebody says, oh, we've got to do one of those awful regulatory impact assessments and one of those equality impact assessments and so on and so on. So again, part of what we're now consulting about is to try and ensure that we remove some of that paperwork burden but actually get something that is really practical and helps people. So if you're really interested in these areas, we have a consultation document that's currently out uh, and which gives people the opportunity to give their views on that. But now if we move to the, the next slide, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit more closely about the civil service and do we practice what we preach. I mean, in terms of the SCS, I mean, I think it is fair to say that the civil service has a pretty good record um, and it's on an upward trajectory. So there was something called the 10-point plan which has now gone into a new diversity strategy. There's a diversity board that Bill Jeffrey chairs, all of which is designed to help increase the number of women, um, the number of ethnic minorities, the number of disabled people at the top of the senior civil service. We've clearly got a way to go, but there is at least some sign of progress. And our performance is better than, uh, as I said earlier, uh, the private sector, but I don't think we should be complacent. And I think one of the challenges for us over the next few years is to ensure that we're just not focusing on senior civil servants. We're actually providing opportunities for people at every uh, level of the civil service to come forward. Public appointments is something that we've just been doing some work on recently. I mean, essentially, um, uh, the number of women in top public appointments, those quangos which uh, we read about yesterday and the day before, uh, very much in the news at the moment, uh, the number of women has been stuck at roughly a third for the last 10 years. The number of disabled people is roughly about 5%. The number of uh, ethnic minorities is about 5%. So we have just set new targets and a new programme to try and increase that so it's pro, pro rata. So I think in terms of practicing what we preach, the story around people is um, lots of commitment, lots of um, desire to do better, quite good progress, but a long way to go. In terms of leadership, I mean, Gus O'Donnell has made um, diversity one of his top four priorities, and I think that's been really helpful. I talked about the diversity board. Uh, we also have um, uh, departmental champions in every department who are pushing this agenda forward. But I think I now want to move away from the people side to actually look at are we really securing what we want in terms of policy and delivery. So if we move to the next slide, I think these are some of the issues that we want people to consider. And if you're interested, we did produce um, an equality guide um, along with our colleagues in the communities and local government, uh, which is available on the um, GEO uh, stand on the first floor. We produced this a few months ago, and I'm just going to run through some of the lessons that we learned from that. I mean, the first thing is, if you really want to make sure that equality is working, you've got to have some true leadership. So it's a question of, does the board, does the management committee, whatever it is that runs your bit of the organisation, does it look at equality on a regular basis? And who's actually accountable for making sure that it is moving forward? The second, which is, I think, just as important, is do we have the evidence as to who we are dealing with, who our customers were? That's what the point of that original 
um, uh, who wants to be an equality millionaire is. I mean, it is interesting looking across government how many policy areas are still sort of designed with a metropolitan elite in view rather than thinking about everybody who is out there who might have a totally different set of needs. So I think knowing who your customers are, whether you're a policymaker or whether you're a frontline deliverer or whether you're in HR is really important. The third point is engagement. Uh, and again, there's some good practice around this. Um, so there are groups like Equality 2025, which is a group of disabled people who you can consult. But when the ODI drew up disability plans um, a few months ago, what they found was that the best plans were those that were actually road tested with real disabled people. Um, no great surprise there, and I think one of the challenges for us all is to make sure that we are talking to the real people out there. Um, and I think that's going to be uh, a growing challenge as we go forward. Fourth key element that we picked up was what we call transparency. Did we tell people what we aim to do? Uh, did we report back? Are we clear about where we're going in these areas? The fifth element is capability. Um, and the capability is more than training. I don't know how many of you have been on equality and diversity training, but sometimes it's sort of um, uh, the worst kind of sheep dip approach which puts people off. And I think what you need to do with capability training, equality and diversity training, is to make sure that it is fit for your organization. Um, Graham and I used to work in the health and safety executive, which was populated by and large by middle-aged men with beards. Um, and, and, and actually, you have, to, uh, you have to be very careful how you talk about this, because it can come across a bit as political correctness gone mad. Once you actually say, look, this is about how you do your job, how do you communicate with different customers out there, different types of organizations, then it makes it relevant. And I do think there's a real challenge for all of us in terms of getting that capability, getting the right training, and then remembering to keep on training people as they go through their careers. Final question is all around performance measurement. Have you got your metrics right? Is it actually part of what is your balanced scorecard or whatever your organization does? Are you measuring equality as part of your business? Because the key message that I wanted to get across on this slide was actually if equality is something that's done over there and not central to delivery, then it won't be done right. Equality has to be central to delivery of what you're trying to do. So those are some of the things that we think that you might want to think about. Other issues to consider on the next slide are um, the link, I think, to socioeconomic disadvantage. This is one of the more politically contentious areas um, in terms of, uh, I don't think every, anybody would disagree that we need to tackle those who are in persistent poverty, but there is clearly a political debate to be had about what the best way of doing that is. But I think as we take the equality agenda forward, we are increasingly interested in understanding some of those interrelationships. So if I go back to Bangladeshi women, we know that Bangladeshi women, by and large, are half as wealthy, or um, uh, wealthy probably not the right word, but their, their, their income is half what the average woman's income is. We know they're much less likely to be engaged in the world of work, much less likely to be engaged in civic life. So that's part of the challenge, I think, as we go forward. Um, procurement is one of the areas that, again, we and the Office of Government Commerce are looking at. Procurement is a real opportunity to think about how do you use your procurement to further equality ends. What we have is about £175 billion pounds worth of procurement done Every, um, uh, every year by central government and the broader public sector. Uh, and we and the OGC have just produced guidance which shows how you can build equality into procurement at different stages of the process. So that's pre-qualification stage, contract award stage, contract monitoring stage. And again, if you're interested in the area, it's all on our website. Gender pay reporting 
is another of those areas which I think people have found quite... I think, actually, we must be getting close to the very important person coming because the audience is, is clearly being bulked up as I go on. But never mind. I will, I'll continue um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to talk. Um, gender pay reporting, uh, essentially, is making sure that your organisation knows what it is paying people um, uh, at different levels of the organisation, both men and women. Equal pay, we've had legislation for 40 years, it actually hasn't yet secured the kind of um, equal pay systems that we would want to see. Also worth noting that there are quite big gaps in terms of disability and also of ethnic minorities in terms of payment. So what we're uh, doing both within the bill and across the public sector and with the private sector is actually to try and get a bit more transparency. Do you know what your gender pay gap is? Do you know where it is? Um, is there anybody here from the Treasury? Oh, good. Um, uh, uh, when, we, when we did our statistics uh, across the civil service, um, we said uh, we'll add up what everybody gets paid. Um, in the different government departments. So we came up with a gender pay gap in the Treasury of about 25%. Now, the Treasury got very upset and, and rang me up and said, we don't have a gender pay gap. I mean, men and women get paid more or less the same. Our gender pay gap's only 5% on the way we do our figures. It's just that we don't have any women in senior positions. <laughs> um, and I said, that was the point. And therefore, I think sometimes crude figures do make people think. And essentially, we're not, we then want people to build on that to see what they can do going forward. The final and most difficult area, in some ways, is positive action. Positive action is the thing that the Daily Mail hates. So um, equality is one of those areas where you can always get a cheap Daily Mail headline, if you like, as Harriet Harperson attacks uh, middle-class white men. Um, but actually, positive action is already lawful, and we wish to make it um, uh, more used which is thinking about what steps you can do to try and get more diversity in your organisation. There is um, uh, an interesting debate, anybody who read Lucy Kellaway in the FT yesterday, about organisations, but most of the evidence is that organisations which are more diverse in their senior management team, that's not just about men and women, it's about general diversity, are more effective. And that applies to all organisations. So positive action is thinking, um, have we actually got a really good cross-section of people within our organisation, within our senior management team? If we haven't, what can we do? It can be training, it can be mentoring, it can be a whole range of things. And I think that's part of what we are very keen to encourage. So I think I'll come to my final slide um, uh, which is, in a sense, uh, in our view, equality is good for the individual, it's good for society, and it's good for the economy. And there is a, sometimes a debate about, well, are you sure that it's the right time to push forward the equality agenda in the middle of a recession? Well, clearly we have to be careful about not imposing undue burdens on either the public or the private sector. And one of the good bits of news is that the new single public sector equality duty will actually be less of a burden than the three existing ones. And similarly, the Equality Bill as a whole will reduce burdens on the private sector rather than increase them. The second key message, though, is equality, diversity shouldn't be over there. It should be core business, on board agendas, in strategy units, in the, the work of those at the front line thinking how best do we reach people. And that's, uh, if we can get that right, Third is we want to move away from what we've seen over the last few years of equality and diversity. It's so complicated we have to bring in a consultant. We need to get to the position that we have simplified it, that the rules are simple, the guidance is simple, and that we can focus on real outcomes. And finally, in any organisation, there's going to be a limit as to how much people can do. So I do think in each of your organisations, you clearly need to prioritise. Thank you very much. Thank you.
First of all, my, my apologies for interrupting you, but I hope you'll see now, uh, see why in a second. We have been incredibly honoured at Civil Service Live 2009 to have a very special visitor with us for the last uh, hour and a half where we've been looking at volunteering between the civil service, uh, the wider public sector, the private sectors and the voluntary sector. Uh, our visitor has seen many of these exhibits and he'd like to say a few words to you. So, ladies and gentlemen, could you please be upstanding for His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Do I take it that this is a surprise for you? Because I, I assumed it had all been organized, but you knew you were about to have me coming along and interrupting all your much more worthwhile discussions uh, on I'm not quite sure what, because I think I've been following somebody around this establishment who was unraveling a ball of string so they could find their way back again. But um, I'm very glad to be able to have this brief opportunity just to join you, because uh, I don't think I've seen quite so many civil servants in one place uh, for a very long time. And as I was saying to uh, Sir Gus O'Donnell just now, I just did slightly wonder going around who was running the country. But uh, <laughs> I'm assured that there's a, a skeleton emergency crew uh, somehow manning all the necessary positions. But um, if I may say so, I'm thrilled that you've all uh, been able to take part in this because um, uh, you may have heard, possibly, of all of the efforts that are being made on the whole issue of volunteering and uh, uh, what has become known as uh, corporate social responsibility and environmental responsibility. And um, I must just perhaps explain briefly that I became president of Business in the Community 24 years ago, can you believe it? And um, I'm afraid I've been badgering uh, and aggravating people during all that time on the issue of exactly that, of corporate responsibility, and trying to encourage companies in the private sector to see the point about employee volunteering, amongst a whole lot of other things. And uh, it seemed, after a certain amount of time, that it would be worth trying to see if we could encourage the public sector as well uh, to look more closely at the issue of volunteering. Uh, and you may also perhaps be aware of the extraordinary difference that can be made through partnerships established between the private, public, and voluntary sectors, NGO sector. And in fact, what uh, I've been trying to do in the last two years to see if we could uh, find a way of, of halting deforestation, tropical deforestation, as a much quicker, cheaper, and easier way of buying time in the battle against climate change really revolves around creating another partnership of that kind. And it's only, I think, through these partnerships that we really can make progress on some of the, the big issues that, that confront us. So um, I was uh, particularly pleased that back in October 2006, uh, I joined a joint corporate responsibility summit at uh, HMRC with the then chancellor, uh, now the prime minister, uh, to examine this whole area of um, uh, collaboration on corporate uh, responsibility between the private, public, and voluntary sectors. And if I may say so, ladies and gentlemen, HMRC has been absolutely at the forefront of all this for quite a long time now. In fact, uh, ever since uh, Sir Nick Montague, who was the permanent secretary, wasn't he, I think, at HMRC, uh, he really did lead the way. Uh, he and somebody else called Anne Chant, who I'm lucky enough to ha now, can you believe it, to have uh, on a part-time basis in my office. Makes a huge difference, I can't tell you. But she knows who to go to <laughs> here and there uh, within the civil service. And as a result, you can very often put together really worthwhile partnerships to look at and deal with particular problems and issues. So uh, I was particularly, I am particularly grateful, if I may say so, to HMRC for pioneering all this and indeed for, uh, in the last few years, providing something like a hundred uh, people from that department 
to work with my Prince's Trust. And all I can tell you is that they have made a fantastic difference to the work of my trust with our team programs, helping, these are personal development courses, really, helping to build self-confidence, self-esteem uh, during 12-week uh, uh, courses. And uh, so you can imagine having uh, volunteers from government departments, like uh, many of you here are from, makes a fantastic difference. I also like to think, and this is the point really, that through volunteering or through secondments, which occasionally we can achieve, uh, all this works both ways because very often the volunteer, the civil servant, can discover through working with a voluntary organisation uh, just what the problems are that that organisation has to face in the world out there. And I think we've discovered through talking, I have anyway, through talking to uh, those who've been high flyers, for instance, from the far streamers from the civil service who've already done these secondments, when they reported back uh, to us, they were saying that they, they found it very revealing to see just how many people out there uh, experience huge difficulties in finding their way through the system. And sometimes it can be needlessly complicating. And I think the fact that through volunteering and through working with these organizations, it's possible then to find out what it's like from the punter's point of view can be hugely valuable uh, in terms of when you return back to your departments. Now, all I can say is that in the work we've done with the private sector over these years, uh, it can sometimes be quite difficult for those coming from the private sector because the line managers usually complain, oh, I can't possibly allow so-and-so away. It's all going to be too difficult and so on and so forth. But funnily enough, once people have done this and have been out, and uh, uh, Sir Gus tells me that he goes around telling everybody that you have to get out of the civil <laughs> service in order to get on in it. Uh, once you've done that, the word starts to come back that it's quite rewarding. Uh, and you can really have an effect. So um, I'm thrilled to see the progress uh, that, is, that is being made. And uh, one more recent initiative that we've managed to get going is called Charity Next, which I just wanted to mention because it came out of an idea uh, that uh, developed into something called Teach First, uh, which brings graduates, again, high-flying graduates, to work as teachers in some of the most difficult schools in deprived areas. And uh, this has been an incredibly successful program, uh, which Dame Julia Cleverden, who used to run business in the community, uh, helped get off the ground in her uh, quite remarkable and indomitable way. But we have huge numbers of graduates doing this now, and their work in schools has made an extraordinary difference. It really has. And many of these graduates remain in education instead of going back into some other uh, private sector organization. So through that, out of that anyway, grew the idea of Charity Next, uh, which um, uh, enables more secondees from the uh, civil service to find placements uh, in, with different organizations throughout the year, either some of my uh, trusts and organizations, Bernardo's, uh, or organizations, charities involved with drugs and alcohol abuse and so on and so forth. But this, I promise you, is making a huge difference. And as I say, secondments are a very powerful tool for professional development, uh, as well as an opportunity for uh, your employees uh, to gain a greater insight into what makes another sector tick. And through this, hopefully, it will be possible to achieve greater joined-up uh, operations. So, um, if I may say so, it's been, for me, a particularly uh, worthwhile uh, afternoon going around this immense establishment, talking to people about some of the work they're doing, uh, and to listen to the difference uh, that, that you were all making. 
you're, we're beginning, I think, a new phase, really, in terms of helping to build these partnerships through uh, this kind of volunteering. But uh, I very much hope and pray that it will be a huge success and that so many of you, ladies and gentlemen, will feel able to take part in this particular uh, initiative because I believe now the civil service is being generous enough to allow you days off in which to do it. Uh, four or five days, I think. Something remarkable. A year. Uh, <laughs> but many of you, most of you will know charities, organizations you mind about, areas that you feel need help. Uh, your skills, your management skills, your expertise can be of immeasurable help, I promise you, to all sorts of organizations, just helping to find their way through the red tape uh, and how to build the partnerships that are needed uh, across agencies and so on and so forth. So I do recommend it to you. Uh, and as I say, uh, I'm enormously grateful to the civil service, and particularly to Sir Gus O'Donnell, who has been so enthusiastic about pushing this whole uh, initiative because it needs somebody at the top to drive this sort of thing through the entire uh, system. So we owe him and uh, other permanent secretaries in the civil service a huge debt of gratitude for their energy and enthusiasm in all this. And I hope before I shuffle off this mortal coil, I shall have the, 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 the good fortune to see many of you working uh, in this way, in different parts of, of the community, in this country, making such a transformational difference to those communities and to people's chances in life. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.